Good morning, everyone. Well, what a joy to be back with you. Very grateful for the warm welcome I received immediately. I came through the, the door, and uh, we indeed do thank you for your prayers for us as a family. I know many in the church have uh, made inquiries and have been praying for our situation. We appreciate that. Father God, we come now to hear you speak, and when you speak, new life the dead receive. You bring a quickening, Lord, and we, we want to see that living, active word ministering to us, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to speak this morning about living between a rock and a hard place. I don't know where you're living at the moment. I don't know your location, your specific address. But I, knew, I, I do know the most important address in the entire world. It's not Buckingham Palace. It's not the White House. It's not even the Kremlin. The most important address in the world is Wits End Corner. You'll always find God at wit's end corner. When you come to an end of yourself, when you don't know which way to turn, when things are overwhelming you, the Bible says God is our refuge and our strength, our very present help in times of trouble. Do you know there's never been a time when Gail and myself have felt the turbulence of troubles so much as in these recent years. But I know this. It is not our problems that define us. What determines how our life develops is how we respond to them. The world famous physicist Albert Einstein once said, adversity introduces a man to himself. And what he was saying very simply was this, troubles reveal the real you. You know what you're like when you're under pressure. You know what you're like. Bubbling to the surface comes the real you. Now that by itself could be quite discouraging. But listen, adversity also introduces us to God. It's in those times of trouble and heartache. When the storms come and the, the difficulties are there, it's a wonderful thing to know that we can find God and often we're awakened to God. We're awakened to our relationship with Him. We're awakened to the fact that we desperately need God in those times of trouble. It was C.S. Lewis, the Christian writer, who, who said this, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Sometimes we can become deaf to God in our complacency, in our uh, our discouragements and disappointments. Sometimes we tend to drift away from the heart of God. And sometimes it's in those times of pain that we begin to hear. And it's not just the unconverted that needs to hear, not just the unconverted that is deaf to God. In the church, the Word of God says, let he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And so there comes that shaking but you know, we're part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Hallelujah. And whatever comes against us, whatever we experience, we can find God in every situation of life. The old hymn says, Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Now, as we think about this subject of living between a rock and a hard place, I want us to consider... Proverbs 24, verse 16. This is a verse that's become very precious to Gail and myself. And it says this, For though the righteous fall at seven times, they rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. Two simple things from that verse. Number one, calamity will eventually strike. And number two, but the righteous rise again. You see, problems will come. It's not a case of if, but when calamity strikes. That might be the case physically or emotionally. Calamities might strike spiritually, financially, or in many different ways, often when we least expect it, right out of the blue, trouble and difficulties come. 
And you know, the Bible is so wonderful that it makes very clear to us, warns us time and time again about the trials and troubles of life. In fact, from beginning to end, we're given that warning that trials and troubles will come. It's spoken of by Nehemiah, Job, David, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Habakkuk, Jesus, Paul, James, Timothy, Peter, and John. And it's why we read now in 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you as though something strange were happening to you. It's the normal Christian life. It's part of living. And we shouldn't be surprised. In fact, one of the great steps we can take to Gaining advantage over our troubles is by being prepared and, and not being surprised when that buffeting comes to us. Calamities will strike, but the righteous, they rise again. Let me give you an example of the troubles coming and yet the righteous rising again and again and again. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul says, We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Hallelujah. Listen, you can't keep a good man down and you certainly can't keep a godly man down. God is always there to be the glory and the lifter of our head, always there to strengthen us, always there to enable us to overcome in every situation. Now to be between a rock and a hard place is a phrase that's commonly used to describe feeling trapped by a problem and not being sure quite what to do about it. The dilemma of choosing between two difficult options, both of which could result in a bad outcome. Without doubt, it's an uncomfortable and unpleasant place for anyone to be. And you know, not just over the last 12 months, but over the last Four years because of the struggles that my youngest daughter has been having with her mental health, we can certainly say we can identify with the predicament of being between a rock and a hard place. On numerous occasions, time and time again, the stress and the pressure has been considerable. But by God's grace, the testimony that we have remains unshaken. And our testimony is simply our God is able to deliver. And I want to encourage you this morning, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, I want you to know deliverance belongs to the Lord. It's his prerogative. He's able to deliver. He wants to deliver, not always when we want him to or how we want him to, but our confident assurance is deliverance belongs to him. That's why it's very important that we stay in a close relationship with him. That, that, that we're, we're not allowing ourselves to get diverted or distracted or in any way discouraged. We keep that close personal relationship with God. And we begin to experience his grace enabling us to overcome. In April 2003, an American mountain climber by the name of Aaron Ralston. He experienced being trapped literally between a rock and a hard place. He was climbing alone in a remote area of Utah when the rocks beneath him began to give way. As he, as he fell, his arm became trapped by a large boulder, making it impossible for him to move. After five days of agony, dehydration, and despair, he faced the dilemma of either waiting in the unlikely hope that somebody would come along or use his blunt pen knife to slowly saw through his arm and be free. He took the radical option. He cut through his arm, but he lived to tell the story. Hallelujah. And I want to say this, as Christians... Whenever we take the radical option of trusting God in times of difficulty and heartbreak and when we're overwhelmed, the radical option, not just of sitting back in comfort or leading a quiet life or de deciding we're going to throw it in, the radical option of trusting God 
We will always live to tell the story. Yet you see, God wants you and I to have a testimony. So many people want the testimony, but they don't want the tests. There's not a long queue of people <laughs> wanting the tests. But the testimony comes out of the tests. And, and you see, look at Daniel. He took the radical option. He was told no longer to pray to God or you'll be thrown to a den of lions. He took the radical option of trusting God and kept on praying. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego took the radical option. They were forced to their knees and said, unless you bow down and worship my image, you'll be thrown to the fiery furnace. They refused to do that. They took the radical option and were thrown into the fiery furnace. When we think of the Apostle Paul, he was shipwrecked, stoned twice and left for dead, imprisoned on many occasions, beaten up badly, persecuted in so many appalling ways. He could have decided to live a quiet life. He could have decided not to be such a radical as he was, no longer to speak out in such a, a way as he did. No, he took the radical option. He trusted God. I want to encourage you to trust God. Even when it seems so hard, so difficult, even when things aren't going according to your plans and things seem so unfair and un unjust, whenever we take the radical option, we will always live to tell the story. And what a story. What a testimony. Do you know when we read Psalm 40, some wonderful words, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a firm foundation, making my steps secure. He's put a new song in my heart, a song of praise unto my God. Now listen, many shall see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. As our sister was giving the example earlier on and the scripture which was talking about that many would see our progress many would see the salvation that we have that it's growing it's moving on and it's becoming stronger that's something that's so important for you and I now we will probably never face such a grim and desperate situation as the mountain uh, climber that we've mentioned but there are circumstances we can all identify with times when we're faced with a problem and we're unsure what choice to make for the best it might be in some context of a, a relationship it might be a, a situation at work it could be a financial struggle maybe our plans for the future perhaps a health matter or an issue in the church but time and time again things will come up and God wants us to be those that trust him those that continue to rely upon him, those that will not compromise in any way. Now, while there are many examples in the Bible of being trapped between a rock and a hard place, the clearest of these is found in Exodus chapter 14. And that's the, the chapter I want to focus on this morning. After over 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God miraculously delivered, delivered his people by a series of amazing miracles. At last, they were free. They marched out of Egypt with confidence, with optimism, and with great expectation. But immediately following their exciting victory, Pharaoh's army came after them, and they were helplessly trapped between the enemy pursuing them from behind and the Red Sea in front of them. It was a massive dilemma, and they had a decision to make. They could either stay where they were and die at the hands of Pharaoh, or they could step into the sea and die drowning. Not much of an option. But you know, what might seem like a, a gamble to some is always turned into a game changer by our obedience to God's word. We will never be the poorer and we will never be the loser when we follow God's instructions. The principle of John 2 and verse 5 is simple, straightforward, and supernaturally liberating. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. 
That's, that's what he wants from your heart and mine, that, that unreserved obedience, where, where whatever it is, even if it sounds ridiculous, even if it sounds as though it, it couldn't possibly happen, God wants you and I to completely be obedient to his word. Now in Exodus 14, God gave his people a way of escape from what seemed an impossible situation. Notice he didn't remove the problem, and very often today God does not remove the problem, but he made a way when there seemed to be no way, and he will do the same for us today. But we've got to listen to his word. We've got to follow his instructions. So let's have a look at five instructions from Exodus 14 that God gave to Moses. And in doing so, We'll discover what to do when we just don't know what to do. And so what, whatever the crisis that you can identify with and maybe you're going through or you've been through recently, whatever the problem or the heartache may be, the first step, the first instruction that was given to Moses to give to the people, don't panic isn't that something we do every time things get out of control or we hear bad news or we're suddenly confronted with, with a difficulty? Our first reaction is to panic. Our mind goes into overdrive. Our emotions get agitated and worked up. Our will and good intentions get weakened. And then we start to make foolish and bad decisions. And so look in Exodus 14, the first part of verse 13. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Our human nature tends always to fear the worst, which is why Jesus frequently said to his disciples, fear not. Don't be anxious. Do not be afraid. In fact, did you know that fear not is the most repeated command in the entire Bible? Because God knows our frailty, he's aware of our, our weakness and our tendency is always to panic. But what we need to see here this morning is that fear is not simply an emotion. Fear is a spirit. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And fear comes with a destructive aim to it. You see, fear distorts the perception we have of every problem. It blows it out of all proportion. It blurs the facts and it obscures the truth of God's word. That's what fear is wanting to do in your heart, your mind, your situation. Now, let me give you an example of this distortion, this blurring of, of, of the facts, the way it obscures the truth of God's word. In Exodus 14 and verse 12, God's people had seen with their own eyes extraordinary miracles. They'd experienced at first hand a mighty deliverance from the bondage of Egypt. But the moment the first problem comes up, look what happens. They're faced with their first problem and they say in the second part of verse 12, we would have been better off serving the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. That's the power of fear. That's the way it can distort and blur and, and obscure the truth of, of God's word. How could they possibly have thought to going back under the tyranny of the Egyptians? They were treated like dirt. They were cruelly treated. That they, that they were in a situation that caused them to cry out for God to deliver time and time again for over 400 years crying out for God to deliver and so God comes in his mighty power and he brings deliverance to them but the first problem they think they were better off that's the distortion the spirit of fear will bring into our thinking and into our priorities and let me ask you this question this morning how long does your victory last you have an answer to prayer. You have a deliverance. You find yourself coming out of a situation. You're blessed by God. Is it just the first problem that comes up? Maybe the second. But how long does your victory last? For these people, their victory didn't last very long. They were already talking about going back into Egypt and they would be better off 
under the Egyptians. The power of fear is seen again in this situation when the spies went in to spy out the promised land. They saw the high wall cities, they saw the giants in the land and the problems that were there. And the Bible says they came back with an evil report. Now it was not evil because it was inaccurate. It was perfectly accurate. It was evil because it was rooted in fear and not faith. It was evil because as they passed on to others, it had a destructive effect. The Bible says the whole of Israel, their hearts melted within them. And they started to say, we're not able to go in and take the promised land. It's a devastating effect it has upon other people. And God's response, this panic that is coming up, this fear that is ruling in their hearts and minds, God's response simply to say, fear not. Now, let's be honest this morning. That's a lot easier said than done, isn't it? When you've just got some bad news and things have just fallen apart and you find yourself confronted with a situation that is so big, it's a lot easier said than done. I mean, the preacher can say this morning, fear not. You, you can read in your Bible, fear not. But it's not easy. And yet, it is gloriously possible, but only when we follow all of the instructions that were given to Moses. You, you see, we've not just got one instruction here. There's four others we're going to look at. If you try and take that one instruction, fear not, don't panic, you'll not be able to do it. But look what happens as we consider the other four instructions. Secondly then, the first instruction was don't panic. The second instruction that's so important is stand still. Exodus 14, the second part of verse 13. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Notice the correlation between standing still and seeing the salvation of the Lord. The salvation of God will meet our every need. There is not one problem, one situation that the salvation of God cannot come into and turn it around. When I think of the heartaches we've been having with, with Naomi and our mental health and the battle with social services and all that's been going on there, we know that the salvation of God is greater and mightier than anything. No, no wonder we've read this morning that extraordinary Psalm, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The leaders and rulers set themselves against the Lord and his anointed. God in heaven laughs. <laughs> now that's not a laugh of sarcasm. It's not a laugh that's coming out of a wrong heart of mockery. It's a laugh at the absolute absurdity of little man coming against almighty God. It's laughable. And so God is saying, we've got to stand still. We, we do too much racing around. So often we're too busy. And, and you know, with all our racing emotions, our anxious thoughts and struggling to work things out, Sometimes we find ourselves unable to see clearly. It all affects what we can see. We've got to stop our own efforts to fix things and instead focus on the presence of God. Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, Be still. And know that I am God. There is a discovery to be made in that time of stillness. A wonderful opportunity for you and I to actually see something perhaps that we've not seen for a long time. Jesus said we've got to get in the closet and close the door. We've got to come aside, get away from all the distractions, all the other voices 
We've got to be alone with God and, and listen to what he's saying to us. You see, in the stillness, first of all, we experience his peace. Secondly, we draw from his strength. And thirdly, we enter the rest that is spoken of in Hebrews 4 and verse 9. The writer to the Hebrews says, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God to enter into. When we're feeling weary and worn out, when we're feeling at an end of ourselves and almost burnt out, we hear the loving words of Jesus saying, come unto me, all that are weak and the heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and you shall find rest for your soul. You see, all our anxiousness and our fears wear us down. We can find ourselves exhausted by worrying. But when we're still, something happens. When we're still, we've got to acknowledge our absolute helplessness. That we're not going to try and fix it. We're not going trying to go on in our own strength without God. This is exactly what happened to King Jehoshaphat. In 2 Chronicles 20, the second part of verse 12, Jehoshaphat was facing three massive armies. <laughs> He'd only got a little army. It was going to be a bloodbath. They were going to be wiped out. There was no possible way that Jehoshaphat could win. But he had the good sense just to stop all his activity and all his planning and just be still before God. And he said, we do not know what to do, O Lord, but our eyes are upon you. Oh, when was the last time you turned your eyes upon Jesus? When was the last time you looked in his wonderful face? When was the last time you found that the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace? And God wants us even this morning just to be still, to bring him into focus. And that time of stillness isn't just when we're at church on a Sunday. That's relatively easy. No, throughout the week, as we seek to, to live for him, we've got to find those times of stillness. We've got to find those times when we come before God. We see the important priority because we're acknowledging I am helpless in myself to sort this one out. Now, Gail and I came to that place many, many, many times with all that's been going on with uh, uh, the situation with, with, with Naomi. We've had to come and say, Lord, I can't fix it. There's nothing I can do to change the situation. But our eyes are upon you. Do you know that makes such a difference? The third step. Number one was don't panic. Number two is stand still. The third step, and this is such a, an amazing truth here. Believe there is a purpose in every problem. I believe that nothing occurs randomly by chance and God is never ever taken by surprise. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. He knows the end of a matter right from the very beginning. He sees it all. Not one sparrow falls to the ground without him noticing it. And he cares for us. He loves us. His heart is towards us. Never think that God's heart is against you. The only time God's heart will be against you is when your proud heart is thinking you don't need God. The Bible says God resists the pride, but he gives grace to the humble. There's grace here this morning for each one of us. From the mercy throne of God, we can find grace to help in time of need. But I, I want to show you very clearly this, this aspect in Exodus 14, God's sovereignty, his knowledge of, of, of things, his intimate awareness. I want you to notice verse 4. Now make the note here that this is spoken before the event. This is God speaking prophetically, not what he has done, 
This is God declaring what he's going to do in this situation. And so we read in Exodus 14, verse 4, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. You see, the ultimate purpose of God in every problem is to maximize our perception of his greatness. Isn't it true that sometimes, if not more often than not, we see a great big problem and a very small God? In Psalm 34 and verse 3 it says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name. <laughs> I believe that's crucial, isn't it? We, you can't make God bigger than he is in himself, but you can make him a lot bigger in your thinking and in your experience, in your heart. You can make him a lot bigger. And do you notice there in Psalm 34, verse 3, the corporate nature, the plural words that, that, that are used there, telling us how much we need fellowship, how much we need one another. No one's expected to go it alone and... and, and be an island and work things out independently? Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us, let us, let us exalt his name together. It's then that we begin to receive strength and, and help and hope. As people have been praying for us all over the country and, and different countries abroad, we've received supernatural strength that is not of ourselves. We understand people care. People are moved with compassion. And, 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 and it's the same with you. If you've got struggles and difficulties this morning, I appeal to you to share it with somebody so that you can both together begin to see the greatness and the majesty of God. Now, if you believe that God truly is sovereign, that he's on the throne, that he, he can see everything as I've just outlined there, we need to stop asking the question, why? Why, why has this happened? Where are you, God? Why have you allowed this? We need to start asking the question, what? What, what, what are you wanting to show me, Lord, in this situation? What are you wanting me to discover? What are you wanting me to learn from this experience? In Romans 8, 28, how frequently we quote it. In fact, I think, was it last week? I watched on, on Zoom about that cactus. <laughs> and it was quoted there, wasn't it? Romans 8, 28. It's easy to say, isn't it, that God is working in every situation for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. It's easy to say that in times that are not difficult, but when the problems come, we need to acknowledge his sovereignty, his control, and that he's going to bring good out of whatever is going on in our lives if we trust him and love him. You see, he brings order out of chaos, light out of darkness, peace out of turmoil, victory out of defeat. And the Apostle Paul believed that God had got a purpose in every problem, and it was that belief that enabled him to rise again from adversity. Have a look at his perspective. And you, you'll notice now when you see this perspective Paul had on his problems, how he could live in victory. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. He said, this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. There is a process of preparation that is going on that Paul could identify with. And that's why James could also say, count it all joy when you meet various trials, knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so here is Paul with his understanding of God of having a purpose He's saying slight. He looked at his problems like a, a flea on an elephant's back. Not the huge problem and a very small God, but a very small problem to a great big God. And that changes our perspective completely. This slight 
momentary. Sometimes it seems as though it's going on forever, doesn't it? It seems there's going to be no end to the thing that we're facing. It's four years on now as far as we're concerned with, with, with Nemi. And it's still going on. The end is not there yet. But this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Number four. The first is don't panic. The second is stand still. The third is believe there is a purpose in every problem. The fourth is feed on God's promises. Beware of feeding on the junk food of doubts and lies rather than the wholesome diet of God's promises. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says all the promises of God in verse 20 are yes to us in Christ Jesus. And it, God's honor is at stake when we're talking about his promises. God has to fulfill those promises because he cannot lie. If he's made a promise, then he will keep it. And he'll bring it to pass in good time. And so look at the promise here in Exodus 14, verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to keep silent. <laughs> I looked at the message Bible concerning that. Oh, and I had to smile when I saw that verse from the message Bible. And it said this, God will fight the battle for you. And you, you just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> because when we've got problems, we want to talk about it, don't we? We, 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 we? And there's nothing wrong with talking about it, but we want to talk and talk and talk and talk about it. And, and we've got nothing to say but the problems. Sometimes we get negative and critical, and bitter, because of the injustice and the type of problem that we, we've got to handle. And God says, just keep your mouth shut. In fact, you know, the only sound coming out of you and I should be the sound of agreement expressed by thanksgiving and praise. There is power in praise. But let me tell you about the important power there is when you praise God before the event. I mean, it, it, it's easy to, before the event of the breakthrough, the answer to prayer, the, the situation turning around. We come with praise then because it's gone. But what about praising God just like they did with King Jehoshaphat, the singers and the dancers? in front of the mighty warriors going forward against the enemy before the victory was established, before it was uh, uh, completed, they started with praise. What about the praise that was heard at Jericho before those walls came tumbling down? There was the shout of praise that went up to God. And Paul and Silas in prison didn't wait until they were released from prison, released from the stocks and chains, and, uh, and the, the bruises and beating had healed up. No, they praised at midnight in the midst of that situation and the mighty move of God came bringing deliverance. There's power in praise. Now, the reason why I say don't wait till after the breakthrough and after the answer to prayer is because what do you do if it doesn't happen immediately or if it takes 12 months or if it takes four years like us, have you got nothing to praise God for? Nothing to thank him for? But if you praise him first that he's in control, you thank him first that he's going to bring the breakthrough, you're trusting in him in the situation. The joy of the Lord is always your strength. You'll not be weeping when you're praising the Lord. And so let me give you a threefold promise to feed on in any battle, any dire situation in Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. The Lord God will go with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. A threefold cord is not easily broken. And look at the, the three cords that are found here. Number one, the Lord your God will go with you. Number two, he will fight for you against your enemies. And number three, he'll give you the victory. Feed on God's promises. And the last step is this. 
Number one, don't panic. Number two, stand still. Number number three, believe there is a purpose in every problem. Number four, feed on God's promises. And number five, move forward in faith. Don't allow yourself to be stationary. I I mean, people that just want to be stationary very soon backslide. Very quickly stagnate in the vibrance and vitality of their, their faith. We need to be moving forward. Exodus 14 and verse 15. God said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to go forward. You see, following God's directive always moves you forward in your Christian life. It's the key to every breakthrough. And as Israel marched forward towards the Red Sea, God split a path right through the middle of it. Verse 22 of Exodus 14. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. You see, if we hold back, or if there's a half-hearted moving forward, what happens? It'll cause frustration, disappointment, and eventually backsliding. A journey that should only have taken 11 days took the people of Israel 40 years to make because they weren't going forward as God directed What a lot of wasted time, wasted opportunity, wasted energy. Shocking as that figure is, 40 years to make an 11-day journey. The more alarming is that well over 1 million people never made it into the promised land. They completely lost their inheritance. It's a challenge, isn't it? We need to be moving forward. And and the way that we move forward is so important. It needs to be with a determination, with a passion in our heart, with a sense of of purpose. Moving forward, determined that we're going to lay hold of all that we have been laid hold of for. Persevering is essential for us all. It was the great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, who once said, by perseverance, the snail reached the ark. Sometimes things can seem very slow at times, often difficult, but embracing setbacks, rising above disappointments, and working through trials is possible when we're determined to move forward. Paul gives us the example of how we need to move forward in Philippians 3 verse 13. He said, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Every muscle, every sinew, every tissue of his body is straining forward to be his best for God. Oh, but you've got to forget the past. Past mistakes, past regrets, and past hurts, and past fears. We've got to forget the past so that we can move forward with perseverance. It was the billionaire and the entrepreneur, Richard Branson, who said, even if you fall flat on your face, at least you're moving forward. All you have to do is get back up and try again. And I wonder this morning, how many just feel in your heart you want to get back up and try again? You've remained quiet for too long, complacent for too long. You've remained in a comfort zone for too long. Yes, you've been discouraged. You've been disappointed. You you, you, you felt a failure at one thing or, or the other. But God doesn't condemn you. God's word always comes so that we're moving forward and we have that sense of destiny and purpose, that meaning to our life. I wonder this morning, Will you get back up? Oh, you've been hurt. You've been offended. You've got good reason you feel in your own mind as to why things are as they are in your relationship with God. But you know deep down, amongst them all, it's just an excuse. But God's given you an opportunity this morning to say, I want to get back up. 
and try again. So in conclusion, God is good even when life is not. Calamity will strike, but the righteous rise again. Because God is greater than our rocks and mightier than our hard places. Let me leave you with one scripture that's been such a comfort, such an encouragement to us. In Psalm 61 and verse 2, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, situations will overwhelm us. Situations will try and envelop us, but the Holy Spirit will lead us to that rock, the rock on which we can stand and, and declare the goodness of God. So when we feel as though we're between a rock and a hard place, the steps that God gave to Moses will work for us today. Don't panic. Stand still. Believe there is a purpose in every problem. Feed on God's promises and move forward in faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Oh, the heart of God, I believe, is, is reaching out to you this morning. His compassion and His love is extended to you. The Bible says God doesn't deal with us according to our iniquities. Quite simply, we don't get what we deserve. God in love is reaching out to you to bring comfort, encouragement and strength, to bring forgiveness and peace, to enable you to go from this place this morning saying, yes, I'm getting up and I'm going forward for God. Let's all stand to our feet right now. We're going to sing this wonderful song. And I'd like to invite those that would appreciate prayer just simply to come forward. This song says, Faithful one, so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock, my peace. There's a, a, a line in this wonderful chorus that says, I call out to you again and again. You do that now, reach out to God. But if you'd like prayer, just come to the front. We'll pray for you in Jesus' name.